those who know my work know that I'm not necessarily known for my, uh, my sunny and cheery optimism about the world, and particularly as relates to this country and as relates to the issue of race. And yet, because I am a father, right, I always try to tease out some optimism out of the worst moments uh, that befall us as a nation. And I do that because I think it's important to give young people hope, right? And I've got two of these young people in my home that I'm responsible for. So I'm always looking for a silver lining in whatever cloud happens to cover, right, the skies of the country. And it's real hard to do that right now, right? Things are um, a little foreboding. And yet I have figured out, and I don't know if I actually believe this, like, I might totally be fooling myself, right? So you don't have to buy it. You might, I don't even know if I buy it. But I'm going to try to tease out some optimism of this moment. Here it is. Let's see how this works, right? For the last eight years, as I've gone around the country doing this work, talking about race in America, and not just myself, other people who do this work as well, for the last eight years, we have been having to convince people, particularly to convince white Americans, that the issue of race and racism was even something we had to talk about. Right? Because people were convinced we didn't have to talk about it anymore because a black man was president. And of course, how can we have a racism problem when a black man is president? Which, of course, is not something we would say about sexism in Pakistan just because a woman, Benazir Bhutto, became the head of that country not once but twice. It's not something we would say about Great Britain just because Margaret Thatcher became the head of state on several occasions. It's not something we would say about Germany or Ireland or Israel or India or the Philippines, all of which have had female heads of state. We wouldn't say sexism was dead in those places. We wouldn't say misogyny and patriarchy had been eradicated there, but in this country, that is sort of what we said for eight years about race and racism just because a man of color was in the White House. So for eight years, it's been like pulling teeth, man. It's like holding people's hands to convince them that racism is the thing. Okay, here's the good news in this bad moment. We don't have to convince people of that anymore, <laughs> right? The hand holding, the teeth pulling, right? We don't have to do that now because it's a little more obvious to people. Now, never underestimate the ability of white folks to miss stuff, though, right? So I'm not saying that everybody sees it. I'm just saying I think it's more obvious now. And the good news, if there is some good news, is that we don't have to do the 101, right? The good news, if there is some good news, is that we now have enough evidence, the resurgence of overt racism, not only in our politics, but around our country, the resurgence and continuation, really, of systemic injustice, ice raids on folks that have done nothing to nobody, right? Talk of building walls, but only on this border, never this border, only this border, never that border, because we're not worried about crafty Canadians sneaking in to take advantage of our health care system, I suppose, right? So we have all of this overt resurgence of Islamophobia, overt resurgence of the othering of those who appear and seem or pray or speak differently than the dominant group. So unlike the last eight years where we were in this sort of intermission period, right, we're sort of back to the continuation of a longstanding tradition. Now, some of y'all may remember back in the day, some of the older folks in the room will remember back when uh, Sunday football, NFL football used to only be on CBS. This is before Fox had a license to show games, and it was just, just CBS, right? And there were usually two games a day. Now, I live in the central time zone, so in the central time zone, I don't know about out here, but it was 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock, right? And the 3 o'clock game, if you were on the East Coast or in the central time zone, would always bleed over into the 6 o'clock hour, which is when 60 minutes comes on, right? And so what would happen, now, if you're on the West Coast, they would show it in real time, you know, because y'all were behind a couple hours, and so you could see it live. It didn't interrupt 60 minutes. But if you were on the East Coast or in Central Time, it would bleed over, and about 6.15, the game would end, right? And the announcer would come in, and the voiceover would say, and now back to your regularly scheduled programming, right? That's sort of what the election of Donald Trump is, y'all, just so you know. It is back to your regularly scheduled programming. It's not something new. It's not a break with tradition. Folks that are tripping on the election of Donald Trump who act like somehow this is a deviation from America's norm, that this is somehow some unique, horrible break with the history of the country. No, the glitch was the eight years of the Obama administration. This is back to your regularly scheduled programming. The history of politicians scapegoating black and brown folks, blaming them for problems that they didn't create, and then getting votes on the basis of that, that's not new. Donald Trump didn't create that, didn't invent that. That's been going on for 400 years back to the colonial period before we even were a country. So the first lesson is don't assume that what's happened all of a sudden is a new thing. 
Don't be shocked by it. This is normal for America. Welcome to your country, right, is what this really is all about. We have to start with that, and we have to understand the past and how the past connects to the present so that we can understand this isn't a unique break with history. And the reason it's important, it's not just an academic point. If you want to fight injustice, you have to know the injustice that you're up against. And if you think that it's a new thing, if you think the monster in the room is new and unique, it becomes disempowering because you don't know how to fight that monster. If you understand that we've seen this monster before, that we've seen this movie before, that there's really nothing new about this, then you can take lessons from our history about how to resist and figure out how to do that again, you see? So we don't want to build up the monster into something bigger than it is. We don't want to underestimate it. But we also don't want to give it more power than it deserves. We have to dissect it, and we have to understand its continuity, not its unique rupture with the history of this country. So let's talk about that.